DMEC in eyes with a hyper deep chamber, that's just a skill that you have to learn how to do. And the reason is there are just so many of these eyes out there. You know, the most common reason why you would have a hyper deep chamber is if the eye is post vitrectomy. But there are so many other reasons why you could have a deep chamber. Like, for example, very elderly patients just have a cineretic vitreous body. And so as a result, with the vitreous liquefied, it just behaves almost as though the eye has been vitrectomized. If you have an eye that's had trauma, if you have an eye with an ACIOL, there are eyes with iris problems. These are just reasons why the chamber would be much deeper than it would be in a normal eye. And if you're unprepared to do DMEC in these sorts of eyes, there'll just be this huge number of patients that you're unable to operate on, or at least operate on with the best, most modern technique. And yes, of course, you can do DSEC in these eyes, but the reason that you would want to do DMEC is because it's a better surgery. It gives the patients better results. It has fewer complications. It's a more fun operation to do. It's generally a quicker surgery to do. So there are a thousand reasons why you would prefer to do your normal standard DMEC, but the key thing is, is you have to know how to do DMEC graft unfolding in these eyes. Of course, the problem is, is with a hyper deep anterior chamber, you can't get compression between the back surface of the cornea and the front surface of, for example, the iris. And if you can't get compression there, then the graft just sort of tumbles around in the anterior chamber, and it's difficult to break open those rolls and apply the graft to the back surface of the cornea. So I'd like hopefully to share with you a few little tips and tricks that we have managed to figure out over the years for how to make DMEC in eyes with hyper deep anterior chambers easier. This is a patient that we operated on in our office last week. This is a gentleman who had a nail gun injury to his eye years ago, which was repaired primarily. He had a corneal laceration, which was repaired. Um, and then secondarily, he had a scleral fixated lens performed via the Yamani technique by a very, very skilled retina specialist in um, a, a state uh, not, not in Alabama where we are from. Uh, so the patient presents to us with this big corneal scar, endothelial decompensation. He has a nice looking scleral fixated lens, but then also this sort of traumatically dilated pupil, also with this iridodialysis and the iris stuck up against the back surface of the cornea. So our task here is to try to clean up some of the scar tissue that's present to repair the iridodialysis and the traumatic medriasis and to do an endothelial graft. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the conge down nasally because I'm thinking this is how I'm going to make my iridodialysis repair. I'd like to use a 10O proline suture on a straight needle to rivet the iris shred to the wall of the eye. And then for actually sewing up the pupil, I tend to like a curved needle because I think the curved needle passes through each edge of the pupil a little bit better, whereas I have better ability to stick the iris to the wall of the eye using a straight needle. So the first step, of course, is just to repair the pupil. The reason we want to do this first is because obviously you can't do it once you have the DMAT graft in the eye. You have to fix the iris first. But the reason not to leave the patient with this big iris uh, defect or this big pupil is actually threefold. Uh, number one, the patient has better vision and cosmesis. If they have a smaller pupil than a larger pupil, they have less glare. Number two, um, probably the DMET graft unfolding will go easier if you have this stable iris diaphragm to unfold the graft on top of. But the key reason, the real reason, the third reason that I'm doing this iris repair is because if this patient needs to be rebubbled after the surgery and you have some post vitrectomy eye with a scleral fixated lens and a widely dilated pupil, when you try to rebubble this patient at the slit lamp, all the air is just going to go directly into the posterior segment. You won't be able to keep air in the anterior chamber. So it's impossible to rebubble these patients at the slit lamp if you have some giant iris defect and the eye is post vitrectomy. 
So I'm sewing up the pupil so if I have to rebubble these patients, the air will stay in the anterior chamber. Now I've repaired the iris, uh, the iridodialysis, and I've sutured up the pupil, but I can't really see a good, nice central pupillary aperture. So this is my capsulotomy handpiece that I always use for making an iridotomy to prevent pupillary block. Well, I'm also going to use it just to make a little pupil here centrally in this iris. So after I've done that, now I've sort of relocated the patient's pupil. I'm stripping the decimase membrane under air using an inverted Sinsky hook. And there is going to be this knuckle of scar tissue on the back of that corneal laceration. And I'm going to reach in and I'm going to grab it and peel it with these coaxial forceps, which in my opinion are just invaluable in cases like this. If you have a complicated case, an eye where you have fibrotic, tattered shreds of decimase membrane with scar tissue. It's so nice to use coaxial forceps to pick and peel them off as opposed to just sort of like scrubbing at it with an inverted Sinsky hook. Now we're about to inject the graft into the eye. And of course, when we're doing any of these eyes that have bullous keratopathy, and especially in a hyper deep chamber, the most important feature of the graft is you want to use a large diameter graft. And the reason is you're not going to get any apposition between the back of the cornea and the front of the iris. In order to pin this graft open, you're going to want to use the graft being wedged in the angle, nasally or temporally or both, as opposed to having some little thing spinning around in the depths of the center of the anterior chamber. So a large graft makes these operations so much easier. So this component of the surgery is completely unedited. We're going to go through it step by step to show exactly how you unfold this graft in a hyper deep chamber. The graft has just been injected. It comes along with this air bubble. So the first thing always, number one, is just to remove this bubble. So now, and by the way, notice I'm using the main wound. There's no risk of the graft being burped through the main wound because the eye is soft. Now I'm going to stick the cannula into the lumen of this graft and I'm going to see if I can check the orientation. Remember if the graft is right side up, then the Motsuro sign is positive. The tip of the cannula turns blue and that indicates the graft is facing properly right side up. So there we go. That's a positive Motsuro sign. It's time to unfold this graft. The number two tip that I can give you is when you're unfolding a graft in a hyper deep chamber, the key is you have to use an air bubble placed on top of the graft. So this is a cannula with air. I'm placing a bubble on top of the graft. So here we go. It's being put into the lumen of this graft. You'll see the graft is sort of halfway open right now with this big bubble, and I'm shrinking the bubble because we don't need a big bubble. We're not trying to unfold the whole graft using this air bubble. We just want the air bubble there to keep the graft edges open a bit for us. Now, the other thing we use always in these hyper deep chambers, in addition to a bubble on top of the graft, is we use those coaxial forceps that I was just talking about with stripping the fibrotic membrane off the back surface of the cornea. We're going to reach in perpendicular to the lie of the graft and we're going to grab the edge and we're going to drag the graft against the bubble. We're not knocking the bubble against the graft. We're moving the graft against the bubble. See, I've got it pinched with one hand and I'm pulling it and I'm sort of swiping that air bubble with my other hand. So now the graft is mostly unfolded and it's being held open by this air bubble. Now, if you just remove this air bubble from on top of the graft, the graft is just going to curl right back up again, okay? And you'll end up with the same scroll. So how do we remove this bubble from on top of the graft and get a new bubble underneath the graft. Well, that's Takahiko Hayashi's double bubble technique. So he's the one who figured this out, that you place a second bubble underneath the graft. It lifts the transplant up against the back surface of the cornea. The first bubble slides to the side where you can aspirate it, okay? 
The key for doing this is you want the bubble that's on top of the graft to be big enough to hold the edges open, but not so big that it's going to resist putting in the second bubble. And when the second bubble is put in, you don't put it directly underneath the first bubble. You put it off to the side a little bit so it can rise up away from where that first bubble is pushing down. If you'll sort of watch the video, I think it'll demonstrate a little bit. So I'm using the main wound again. I put the cannula in and then off to the side just a little bit and I'm injecting my second bubble, okay? So there's the second bubble. I've got the graft sandwiched between the two bubbles. There's one underneath and there's one on top. And now I just aspirate the bubble on top, okay? And when I aspirate the bubble on top, then the second bubble slides over and then the graft is applied to the back surface of the cornea. So there we go. Here's the second bubble being aspirated, okay? But you'll notice here that look, the graft is totally unfolded, but it's decentered. The graft is decentered in the eye. So what do you do? How do you center the graft up again, okay? Well, I shrink the bubble once again because we don't want a bunch of pressure. We want to be able to move the grafts. You want a small bubble. And then we use those same coaxial forceps that we've already used twice so far during the surgery. We put them through the main wound again. So all of the steps of the surgery, we're using the main wound. And you grab the edge of the graft and you just sort of drag it over by the edge over where you want it. So here I am just sort of shimmying the graft down into the centered part of the eye. So there the graft is fully unfolded, opposed to the back surface of the cornea, and now we're just going to expand that bubble to pressurize the eye and lift the graft up back to where it belongs firmly. Okay. So I hope that this was apparent from this video that there's no random tapping on the surface of the eye. There are no random jets of fluid in the anterior chamber to sort of see what happens and see if you get lucky. Um, DMAC in these really complicated eyes can be super straightforward and predictable and algorithmic, just like cataract surgery in a complicated eye. You know, with cataract surgery, you're not like scratching your head and just sort of fumbling around and seeing what works. You know, you have a plan going in. There are certain tricks and certain techniques, tactics that you can use that work reliably when you have various complicated setups. It's the exact same thing with DMEC. You know, even in these complicated eyes, graft unfolding can be a 20 second process that's very reproducible and reliable if you know what the tricks are. And the tricks are, number one, you want to use a large diameter graft. Number two, you use coaxial forceps to grab the graft and move it against number three, an air bubble that you put on top of the graft. In order to transition the bubble from the top to the bottom, you use Dr. Takahiko Hayashi's double bubble technique, which is just brilliant. And then to finally manipulate the location of the graft, use coaxial forceps. So all of these lessons we had to learn ourselves the hard way and hopefully you won't have to go through the same sort of painful learning process that it took us. I hope this video is helpful and if we can provide any other information for you, people learning DMEC or doing DMEC, of course just let me know.